Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts 2, verses 1 through 18. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem. When they heard the sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? Every one of them. How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, regions of Libya, bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they are full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say, thanks, thanks be to God. God. If you see my paper shaking, or my lips quivering, just ignore it. This is hard for me. I had many encounters with the Holy Spirit, the most glorious one, it was 40 years ago when I asked the Lord to come into my heart. I was going through a rough time in my life, trying to bring up two children on my own with no one to help. My parents had passed away when I was in my 20s, and my girl's father didn't really want to be part of their life. One of my friends where I worked knew I was going through a rough time, invited me to go to church with her. I went several times, and I knew something different was happening. I couldn't wait to the next week. Excuse me. They had an altar call every week where you asked if you would like to make a spiritual commitment to Jesus Christ public. Well, I wasn't going to do that. There was no way I was going up in front of a lot of people. Well, every week the same thing kept happening. Something was stirring up inside me. I knew the Holy Spirit was trying to get me to do it but I was resisting. One Sunday, we happened to be sitting way down in front of the church, and they had, again, an altar call. I know the Holy Spirit was nudging me to go forward, and again, I kept trying to resist him. I started shaking so bad, I had to sit down. I started crying, and at that point, I knew what was happening. It was the Holy Spirit working in me. It felt like I was lifted right off that, off that pew to go up to that altar. That Sunday changed my life. I got down on my knees and I asked the Lord to come to my heart. That's when I became a child of God. I know the Holy Spirit is truly present to guide us, to comfort us, and to convict us. He changes our way of living. There will always be trials and tribulations, but we have the help of the Holy Spirit. And, and we have the help of the Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us through them. All we have to do is ask. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, If you confess with your mouth 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing you, confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And I have been through a lot of trials, but all we have to do is ask our Lord. He is there to help us. Thank you. So today, we're finishing the Holy Ghost Stories. This is our last week talking about Holy Ghost Stories. And we've talked about how sometimes we experience God and sometimes people like feel a touch from God or something like that. Sometimes we hear a voice or a thought from God. Sometimes we see a vision that God gives us. And today we're talking about when we're able to do something that we didn't think we could do. When God's Spirit gives us power or courage or a new ability. So the story we read was the story of Pentecost when the disciples, this was after Jesus died and was risen again, the disciples were all together and they started being able to talk in all these different languages that they didn't know. Have you ever been able to do that? Just, wouldn't that be nice on your Spanish test? Just all of a sudden, fluent in Spanish. That'd be great. Have you ever been able to do something you didn't think you could do? Like what? Score a goal, yeah. When it seems like you're never going to get through, and then you do. Um, join the football league. All right, join the football league. Yeah, that's a big one. Anybody else ever do something you didn't think you could do? Or do something that you never thought you would do? And all of a sudden you find yourself doing something like, try a pickle. That's a good one. How'd that go for you, Cassidy? It's disgusting. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Well, I have, I have a Holy Ghost story about when I didn't think I could do something, but I was able to do it. I don't know how. So, lots of you are older siblings, yes? I'm old. Oh boy. Yes, I'm an older sibling. Oh. So you maybe remember when your mom went to the hospital and was going to have your younger sibling, right? Do you remember that? I love that. Yeah. Well, I had my son Wade just over two years ago, and he was early, and he was still upside down. He wasn't going to come out. So they said, we're going to cut him out. Have you, has anybody ever heard of that happen? Their mom has a C-section. Three of them. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Well, they told me that's what we have to do. There's no other way. And so you go into this operating room, and it's freezing cold, and you have this little sheet around you. And they say, hold completely still, because we're going to put this huge needle in your back to make you go numb. So I'm freezing cold, I don't have any warm clothing, and I'm about to have a baby, so I'm a little nervous, and they tell me to hold completely still. And I'm sitting there shaking like a leaf, thinking I'm going to end up paralyzed because I can't hold still. There's no way I can hold still. And so I just said, i got to pray, of course. So I just closed my eyes. And I prayed for God to help me hold still. And then I didn't even know anything happened. They just said, okay, you're good. You can lie down. You better lie down because you're about to go numb. <laughs> so somehow God helped me relax. And even though I was freezing cold, I stopped shivering. It was, it was seriously a miracle. And I felt God with me in that operating room because it's scary. But I let God empower me to be still and then I would, great things happen right Wade was born 
and we had a new baby, and it was wonderful. So sometimes it can be a little scary to let God in and take over, and you don't know if it's really going to work because you're so anxious or nervous and you don't think you can do this thing. But when we do, when we let God take over, we are better for it and the whole world is better for it. Just like when the disciples let God take over and they were able to speak to everybody in every language and tell the whole world about Jesus, from that day, the church grew and grew and grew and spread around the world because they were able to do that. We think of it as the birthday of the church. Just like Bryson's birthday. Change the world, right? So, remember that this week as you are back to school, doing things that are hard that maybe you don't think you're going to be able to do, like maybe be nice to that person who's mean to everyone. That can be hard. But let God take the lead, give you the power to do what you didn't think you would ever do or that you didn't think you could do, and the whole world will be better for it. We need you to lead us and to let God lead us all. So will you, will you work on that this week? Let God lead you? All right, so we want to get our year off to a great start. So we brought all of our book bags in. Does anyone else have their bag or briefcase or something they want to bring forward? I'm going to ask you all to grab your book bags and turn around and hold them up. If you don't have yours, that's okay. You can just stand up there with everybody. So if you've got your bag, we can move down this way a little. All right, come on down. Hold it up if you've got it. And then all of you guys, I want you to hold your hands up in the ancient symbol of blessing. We're going to hold our hands up and just imagine all of God's love pouring from us onto these backpacks and these children before us. You ready to pray? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, bless these backpacks. Make them strong for their job of helping our kids to learn. May their straps never break, their padding never give out, and their zippers never jam. May they not be forgotten in strange places. May the burdens in them be light. And may the bodies that bear them be strong and growing and whole and blessed, ever blessed by your love. Bless these children and all of their fellow students. Bless our teachers and administrators and staff. Be a spirit of peace and love among us all this year that we would continue to learn and grow in your care. In the name of the great teacher, at whose knee we are all students, we pray. Amen. As promised, we are hearing more about the community dinner. And you might be thinking, what do you mean? It's not the end of the month. Well, that's because we're doing community dinners twice a month. From now on, this spring, we stepped out in faith and asked our community to support us in funding a new commercial stove for our kitchen. And God was faithful for our community. In a matter of weeks, we raised the $6,800 that we needed. And through the hard work of Elaine and Marv and Terry and so many others, who came together and coordinated the delivery and installation, we have a brand new commercial stove that works so well and has enabled us to be able to provide twice monthly community dinners. So we don't want this gift, this blessing, to 
go waste it. We want it to feed as many people as we can. Tony and Darlene are excited. I mean, I'm amazed how excited they are to be serving twice a month. And we, that means we need help in the kitchen cleaning up, and we need help spreading the word. We want to feed all the people that are hungry in town or who are hungry for fellowship and community. So please be spreading the word that twice a month now we're serving dinner. And in fact, if you're hungry, you can come and eat with us three times a month. The first Thursday at Dinner Church, it's a potluck at 6. And then the second and last Thursdays, so if there's ever a month with five Thursdays, it'll be the last Thursday. Second and last Thursdays, community dinners. Everyone's welcome, and we're even extending the hours. So 4.30 to 6.30 instead of 5 to 6. We're adding a little time on both sides for people to come. And this month is ham and potatoes and dessert. Corn and, and rhubarb crisp. Ooh, corn and rhubarb crisp. All right. And scalp, it's scalp yeah, potatoes and yeah. ham. Delicious, hearty meals, twice a month. Please spread the word and, and continue to share the gift that God has given to us in our community. To use it well and to feed hungry people. So that's how we can be in stewardship to God this week. Spread the word and come eat. I would ask you now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, make your truth known to us this day and forever. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As summer is coming to an end here, we are wrapping up our Holy Ghost Stories series. We've been engaging in this idea of Holy Ghost Stories for a month now as a way of helping us really walk the walk. Right? That's our focus for the whole year, walking the walk. We want to actually live like followers of Jesus every day of the week. So we're getting together every Sunday. For the past month, we've been sharing our stories of the times that we've experienced God interacting with us in some really tangible way. And hopefully, it's helped us notice God's presence more in our lives, the little Holy Ghost moments that we've had. And I really hope it's inspired us to share our stories with other people. We've read Holy Ghost stories from the Bible and heard from our own members about their experiences of God, including the physical sensations, hearing God's voice or a thought from God, seeing God or a vision from God. And now today, we heard the story of receiving God's power. Sometimes the Spirit's presence is made known to us because we suddenly have an ability that we didn't have before. We find we ourselves doing something that we didn't think we could do, or maybe that we would ever do. And surely, that's how the disciples must have felt that day. I'm sure they would have never guessed that they'd be preaching about Jesus during the Pentecost festival in the middle of Jerusalem in languages they didn't even know. There's probably three or four things in that one experience that they never thought they'd be able to do or that they ever would do. Because, first of all, just before this, they had kind of been hiding out, right? Their teacher, their leader, 
of this movement had just been executed. For all they knew, they were next. So they were at least, they were trying to keep a low profile. So the fact that they went out into the streets of the capital during the festival was impressive. But then they start preaching about Jesus, the one who had just been executed. That was crazy. They could have been thrown in jail. And then, of course, they discovered all the visitors who were in town for the festival can hear them in their native languages. And there were bright lights, like flames over their heads, and the sound of a rushing wind. This might be the Holy Ghost story of all Holy Ghost stories. And it freaked some of the people out who were there, right? Some of them quickly started rationalizing, oh, these guys are drunk. But Peter sets the record straight. First of all, it's early, right? I love that. that that's his first rationalization. It's only nine, we're not drunk. Plus, he says, this is exactly what was predicted by the prophet Joel. God said, my spirit will pour out on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. This is how we know God's spirit is with us when we see visions, when we hear a voice or a thought, when we dream dreams. This is how we know because God said so through the prophets. And this is how the disciples knew in their momentary new abilities that these were given by God's Spirit, that they were being filled by the Spirit of God. When we encounter God, we can receive great power, the power of God, to do things we thought we never could do. Carol's story is just the perfect example. Her sharing today is a perfect example of God's power. I don't think she would have been able to do it without the help of the Holy Spirit. She didn't want to do it. But God empowered her to. And that story reminded me of how, of the Quakers, of how they got their name. Quakers, you might know, actually call themselves the Religious Society of Friends. They call each other friends. But they came to be known as Quakers because in their worship services, they just sit together silently, sitting with the Holy Spirit, waiting for a message from God. And their instructions are to resist speaking until they can't resist any longer. So they would all sit together in silence until somebody started quaking. Quakers, with the urge, quaking with the urge to share a message from the Spirit. And so they would stand and share whatever was given to them in the silence. This submitting to the Spirit's power can feel scary, or at least unsettling. Like Carol said, she was a wreck. It's hard. But, like she also said, that day changed her life. She was so much better for having let the Spirit empower her. And so are we. The disciples, I'm sure, were unnerved by their experience. But what an incredible gift the world received that day. Because they submitted to the Spirit's empowering. That day of Pentecost is known as the birthday of the church. When we feel God's presence with us, we may be empowered to do something that we never thought we could do. And when I say submit to the Spirit, that's a hard word. We don't really like to submit. But it's not a submitting to be overpowered. 
It's a submitting to be empowered, right? There's a difference there. It's not losing yourself. It's letting God make you a complete and new expression of yourself. It's letting God take the lead and empower you. And when we do that, our lives are better, but the whole world is improved as well. Now I've got one last Holy Ghost story I can share. I've used them all up at this point, so I figured might as well tell the last one. But I hope that we'll keep sharing them because I know they're going to keep happening. So next time you have a moment, I want to hear about it. So my last Holy Ghost story needs a little background. In the early morning hours of the 4th of July in 2006, my father was shot and killed in his backyard. The neighbor that he had been feuding with for years had made the life-ending and life-changing decision to resort to violence. I got this news hours later while I was counseling at Skylake. My brother called me and told me what, had, what we had always kind of half-joked about finally happened. He finally pissed somebody off enough. And they shot him. There were no tears in our conversation, only disbelief and silent remorse. Because my father was a deeply troubled man. I'm quite sure he was bipolar. He had bipolar disease, which he's not to blame for, but I did blame him for never getting the help he needed. Instead, he continued the cycles of violence and dysfunction that had been passed down to him from his parents, and he attempted to treat his illness with alcohol. So he would fly into rages, and you know, he was only physically violent towards my mom a few times, but that threat was always there, and very real. He would throw things and scream and curse, call us names. Basically, made everyone else feel as bad as he felt. He, you know, late at night, turn the TV all the way up while we were trying to sleep, stomp and yell. And so my mom and my brother and I, we were just an anxious wreck all the time. We never invited people over, never a birthday party or sleepover. He couldn't hold a job for more than six months, so we were always struggling financially. And just nothing was ever good enough. In the times of his mania, the screaming would stop, but he would go out on shopping sprees and spend money we didn't have, or start big projects that never got finished. And inevitably, something would set him off, and he'd be screaming and throwing stuff by the end of the day. It was complete chaos and terror. Now, I don't share this for any sympathy, but just, you know, we all have the hardships in our lives anyway. And just, it's what you need to know to know the second half, for the second half of the story. I hadn't seen or spoken to my father for more than six years when I learned of his death. Before those years, I was always afraid, still, that he would show up somewhere and cause a scene. I always thought I saw him in a store, driving through town. My fear haunted me. And so that was really the strangest part of his death for me, knowing that I could let that fear die with him. But several months after his funeral, I was at college, and one night I had a dream. The dream began as I was driving down the road to my father's house, where I had lived for many years. And I pulled into the driveway and saw him standing on the porch. 
He was standing in the doorway of the house, leaning his arm against the top of the floor, door frame. He was 6'6". He was a really tall man, which usually added to his intimidating presence. But this time, I looked him in the eye without fear, and I could see that he was calm. His eyes let me see a peaceful soul inside. And he smiled and told me how proud he and my mom were of me. I said, thanks, Dad. And he patted me on the head and said, love you, kiddo. And then my mom came out, and we just said goodbye. And he said, be good and have fun as he had said many times before. And then we got in the car and drove away, with him standing on the porch smiling. That was the best dream I'd ever had. And I woke in awe at what I had just experienced. I'd never seen my father so calm and present and happy. And so later that day, I called my mom. But before I got a chance, before I got the words out, my mom says to me, I have to tell you about a dream I had about your dad. And I said, I had a dream too. And so she told me she dreamt that we all went on vacation together and it was so realistic. And she said he was better. He was normal. He was happy. So I told her about my dream and we just cried together in utter astonishment. We just kept saying he's okay. He's okay now. I know without a doubt that God's Spirit allowed me in that dream to peek through the veil, to see my father's truth for the first time unmarred by illness and pain. The Holy Spirit's power poured out on my mom and I and allowed us to dream a dream that empowered us to find release, to forgive, to let go the years of abuse, something I thought I never could do. And I am so much better for it. And I've got to think the world is better for it too. Jesus breathed out his spirit the Holy Spirit of God, into the world, onto the disciples, and said that the Spirit lives with us and is in us. Jesus said the Spirit will guide us in all truth. The power God gives us is the truth that the world so desperately needs. When just the right words come, when we're able to release our anger or fear, when we're able to forgive or stand up or meet hate with kindness or injustice with integrity, in all those moments, that is the Spirit empowering us. Amen. The Spirit is in us, but we've got to let the Spirit lead. And living led by the Spirit will heal us and the world. So may we allow God's Spirit to lead our lives. Not just this week. Every day. May we allow the Spirit to empower us. To do what we never thought we could do, but to do what God most needs us to do. To help heal the world with love and truth. 